Brady, thank you for joining us on the podcast today. Uh, really appreciate your time. Um, and we wanted to get you on in particular because I think you know your story and your journey to to captain of, of Leeds United women's team is it's fantastic. I think it'll be a great story to hear for uh, for many of the, the players that we've got at Foot Tech and, and wider and the parents obviously as well. Um, so just before we get into it, I wanted you to just give us a brief history of you, your, your journey from grassroots hero to uh, to captain Leeds United. <laughs> Yeah, so I started playing when I was about eight years old in school. Um, so I did play with the boys. Um, always had a football at my feet, always playing on the street with the lads on the street. Uh, parents encouraged it, to be fair. I think, you know, it's different nowadays, isn't it? Everyone's on their Xbox and the PlayStation and stuff. But, you know, when I was growing up, we, you know, we were out on the street all the time. So um, there was actually a local girls team in Castleford called Castleford White Rose Ladies. Um, they're still about today. So I joined them when I was eight years old. Um, and we used to play against Doncaster uh, Rovers Bells and they were one of the, the top teams uh, for women at the time so I decided to leave White Rose and go to Doncaster and that's where I spent quite a few years growing up um, obviously parents traveling back and forth to Doncaster three or four times a week um, and then from there I went to other local clubs so Sheffield Wednesday, Bradford City, um, spent a bit of time in, uh, in America so I went to Marshall University in West Virginia uh, I only stayed there for four months though because it wasn't for me at the time um, so I came back but obviously now I'm with my beloved Leeds United and I absolutely love it so uh, yeah like I said I, I have been to a few different teams but I think you know I've learned different things at each of those teams and um, I think all the experiences make you into the player that you eventually end up being. Yeah definitely that's brilliant and we, we were talking before weren't we about the, the Leeds United thing now and how the the women's team was sort of put to one side a few years ago under former ownership, but now it's really it's you know it's up and coming again, really again, isn't it? And you, you're playing up at Thor Park, you're training up there. It's just it's I can imagine for somebody like yourself that loves the club and, and loves the football to be put you know to be for it to be there now is just a fantastic thing for you. Yeah, we we are really fortunate with the facilities and everything we've got. We, it's one of the best in the league, if not the best, um, and even in the league above, to be honest with you. Um, and I think a lot of the men's teams are starting to take note of the women's teams now. And you'll obviously look at the Super League. You've got your Arsenal, your Chelsea's, uh, your Liverpool's and things like that. And they, they are putting more uh, more effort, more money, more publicity into it. Um, and Leeds United want to do that as well. You know, we, we have a name to get into the Super League, but in order to do that, we do need the backing of the men. And, you know, we are lucky that they've got that. And like you say, you know, we drive up to Thorpe Parts, you know, three times a week, and you know, every time you go there, you think, "Wow, I'm actually training here." Um, so it is pretty surreal, and I know, I know when other other teams come and play us there, you know, they they they're just looking all at what we've actually got. So you know, we are really lucky, and we do appreciate it, yeah. And uh, and also, I think was it last season or the season before you were sharing a, a stage with uh, Mr. Pablo Hernandez for goal of the season contender, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how that came about um, I don't score many goals we were just talking about that as a centre uh, defend, defender I don't tend to score many goals but um, yeah I just took a free kick um, against a team called Charlie and it happened to go in uh, it was quite a long range to be fair and the video footage weren't the best um, and I was just laid on the sofa one day and I got this notification that uh, LUFC have tagged you in a, in a tweet and I looked and it said you've been nominated for goal of the season and I looked and it was against like Alioski, Pablo Hernandez um, I think it was La Soga at the time and I was like, oh my God, this can't be happening. Um, and all of a sudden, I got hundreds of extra followers and it was just absolutely crazy. It went on the big screens where I work in an office in Leeds and, uh, you know, all my colleagues were voting for me and things. And obviously, I didn't win. I think it was Pablo Hernandez that won. Um, but just to, be, just to be nominated and, and for people to actually see my name was just quite surreal. Yeah, it's brilliant. I, I saw the video, I think, of you trying to recreate it. Um, oh, well, I don't want to talk about that. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I used to play on that on that pitch um, way back when on a Sunday, I used to play for the Ford Green and we played on that pitch and it, yeah, it flashed up and uh, yeah, didn't quite go according to plan, did it, for, uh, for a few takes? No, it, it took a few <laughs> takes, but it took a few takes, but we got there in the end. But I had some good fun trying to recreate it, yeah. Okay. Um, so... You mentioned before you started off as a kid on the street, as a lot of us did, because you and I are similar ages. We were just out playing from morning to, to night. Um, obviously, you don't see that as much anymore. But did you did you do any other sports as well, Bridie? Were you very sporty at school? Was it just football? Did you do anything else? 
Yeah, I was always really sporty. So I, I did everything that I could really. So athletics, netball, hockey. Um, I think the only thing I didn't do was rugby because I don't think we had a girls rugby team at the time. But, you know, if they had done, I probably would have done that. Um, and I also played golf as well. So my stepdad, he's a professional golfer. So I was really into my, my golf, really. But um, football was my main passion. But I think, um, I know, you know, one of the questions that, that you were thinking about was, you know, does that help in terms of football and I absolutely think it helps there's a lot of transferable skills I think obviously you've got your teamwork and your leadership obviously if it's a team sport but just like agility and fitness changing direction awareness like there is a lot of transferable skills but it's not to say if you don't play any other sports that you still can't make it in football because you can if you if you're passionate about something that much and you want to do it um, but I definitely think playing other sports it doesn't do you any harm yeah it's, it's interesting and um it's probably for another podcast, but we, we've been doing a lot of research, our end on on movement for children and how, like I said, you and I were out playing on, on the street, we were climbing trees, we were doing all sorts of stuff, movement-based that kids don't do as much now. Um, so the, the way that kids can get that extra movement education, I suppose you'd call it, is by doing multi-sport. But what we're finding is that, that a child will specialise in football from, say, six or seven. And then play football six, seven times a week until they're 16, 17, 18. They just get burnt out. But they're only able to move in certain ways. So obviously, there's injuries and things like that. And, uh, and like I say, I won't, I won't bore you now, but there is, there's a lot of research going to, particularly over in Ajax and places like that. And there's academies now, uh, Burnley are one of them, that are introducing multi-sport as part of their curriculum. So it's, I think it is interesting to talk to somebody like you that's gone on to do so well in, in her chosen sport of football. But had the other sports almost supplementing that and I guess helping you in other ways as well. So, yeah, it was, a, it was something I wanted to, to ask you really because it's, um, yeah, like I said, there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff going on in the background about it. Um, you, what made you get into, what made you choose football then? Because you, you seem like you were good at everything and obviously golf as well. What made you get into the, the world of football? Um, like I said, it was at, at primary school, really. I went to a primary school in Garforth, a really good primary school. And uh, somebody came in one day externally and, and did like a football session. And I think I just joined in that. Um, and they kind of spoke to me and said, look, do you do you play for a team? And I was like, no, I just, just, just play at school, really, in the playground. And they were like, you really should, you know, join join a girls football team. And I was like, well, do they even have them? Like, where, where are they? And they were, I was lucky. There was a, a girl there, uh, Fiona Berry, who did go on to play for Leeds United as well. And she played at uh, White Rose Ladies. Um, so she, got, she kind of got me in touch with with White Rose really so I was quite lucky that you know I, I did live in Castleford at the time and there was a, a girls team on my doorstep but there's a lot more girls teams now than, than what there was um, and like I said I didn't even know that existed at the time and it was just because somebody put the word in but I think now kids are growing up girls and boys in primary school and they know that the opportunities are there now. Definitely um, and, and it's interesting that you mentioned before about the um, playing playing with and against the boys as a, as a junior as a primary school uh, footballer because they it is brilliant at the minute we're seeing more girls participating in sport um we're seeing the, the wildcat centers and things um set up all over all over the place which is essentially free places for, for girls to go and train but i just wonder and that's something you and i were discussing i just wonder is there a trick being missed somewhere and and has development been hindered a little bit by by doing that in a way because you allowing girls to play with and against boys i mean you correct me if i'm wrong but how, how did that help you did, 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 did you think you'd have been a better player for just playing with girls or did playing with boys help you personally no, I think I was probably one of the minority of the girls in my, my primary school that played football. And, you know, to when you looked to the playground, it was just all boys playing. So if I wanted to play football, it would have had to have been with the boys. Um, but to be fair, you know, I, I were quite lucky. I mean, I don't really remember who exactly I played with, but I didn't really have any inclusion issues. Um, but I, I will, I always remember a game that I played against another school and they said, oh, she can't play, she's a girl. And some of the lads in my school were like, well, she's probably better than you. And they were like, yeah, whatever. And it were a bit of kind of like banter, even at like seven, eight years old um, and I just I just remember absolutely just bossing this game and everyone being like oh my god like she can actually play football um, but yeah like I said I, when I played you know with boys on the street and stuff like that and it does toughen you up a little bit to be fair um, but like I say it got to the age where um, you could no longer play anymore I think the age was about 12, 13 mm -hmm. um, and I was really frustrated because I thought you know I feel like I could still you know keep up with the boys and I can I can still challenge them but um, obviously there was just a rule in place that you, you can't play when you get to a certain age which was quite disappointing but like I say I was lucky that at the time there was a female team uh, around me anyway so I, I didn't I didn't have to stop playing football it just meant that I couldn't really play it for the school 
Yeah, and that's and that's the thing. The, the, the opportunities are there now, aren't they? On the on the girls only side of things, but yeah, I, th- I think the, the 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 part of me thinks that I, I think mixed training in particular should be should be encouraged, particularly at the primary school age, because I think they learn a lot from each other. And we've seen it with our sessions. Our yeah. sessions are mixed, and and we, we preach about her all the time. And I was talking to you off air about her, but you know, a little girl that came to us is, is probably pound for pound the best we've ever had. Play, never played football before. I think she was year one, year two, and just came, got battered by the boys week in, week out. But just came back, came back. Never, never didn't have a ball at her feet, and she's now, you know, she's under twelves at at your club, and she's probably going to go on to to bigger and better things in the future, and hopefully might be captain like you one day. And and, and I think she'd hold that. You know, if you asked her, I think she'd say playing with and against boys really, really helped. And so yeah, I was just keen to get your. Yeah. You know, you're taking. I think it's interesting that you've you know you had a similar experience. I suppose I don't think it's a coincidence. Um, when you were a kid and you got the bug, did you? What was your approach to training? Um, was it more play based, or did you just sit right? I want to be a footballer, so I'm I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah, well, like I said, I mean, when I joined the, the female team, I, I didn't really know what to expect. But um, obviously, I learned what an actual training session was for females. And, you know, you do a bit of everything, a bit of ball work, a bit of fitness. Um, so, you know, I kind of just took a few things from there. But I did used to practice quite a bit uh, by myself as well. Um, and, you know, I always had a football and I always used to go to like the local field. And there were a few lads on my street and we all had a football each. So there were about five of us in total with five footballs. And we used to take it in turns to we, we'd pick a tree out of, you know, random field and be like right we've got to aim for that tree and if you hit the tree um then you get 10 points or whatever it was and I just practiced and practiced and practiced um and to be fair even even now I'd probably say you know my strength is probably my passing um and I I do take it back to just being a child and just practicing all the time always doing kick-ups always kicking a ball against the wall um because obviously it all helps with your control and you know I I do get people messaging me now saying you know how did you improve your touch and what did you do about this and um, it literally is just a case of practicing don't wait until your training day to learn something new or practice that skill again I'd just say just keep practicing it whenever you can yeah the, it's funny that there's some some kids don't know what kick-ups are and it's something <laughs> we we introduce immediately with our curriculum it's like you, you, I mean when we were seven eight you could do hundreds just because you never you just did them yeah. all the time didn't you? and, and, uh, and like yeah. you say just for, for your touch your control your coordination these little things that they can just do at home in the garden. And, and, and you mentioned the wall. I mean, what can't you do with a ball against the wall? It's just, you can be there for hours, yeah. can't you? So you just, you just don't see enough of yeah. it, but it's, yeah, it's, yeah. So that's, that's uh, interesting. Yeah. Um, you mentioned your, you mentioned your stepdad, obviously golf, um, golf pros, obviously, you know, sport running through, through the, the family. How did your, how did your family, influence you and help you get from there to, to where you are now um yeah no it's a, it's a good question i think that they always wanted me to be sporty which i always was and you know my dad played rugby my mum plays golf she was always really sporty um so it you know being sporty does run in the family but they just let me do what i wanted to do they let me play for who i wanted to play for you know they didn't put me under any pressure or anything um but yeah i mean obviously growing up and before i could drive they used to have to drive me to training so when i lived in uh, when i played football for castford white rose i could walk there but then when i wanted to play for doncaster bells you know i couldn't walk there <laughs> Um, so, you know, twice a week, you know, my mum and dad were having to drive me to training um, and because it were in Doncaster, they just had to stick, stick around. So they'd sit in the car or they'd go shopping to the local supermarket or whatever, just to kill a bit of time. On a weekend, it was the same story, just taking me to football. Um, I mean, without them, I, I probably wouldn't be playing football now. Um, it just it wouldn't probably have been possible. Um, and I think I always had like the latest, like Adidas Predators and stuff like that. That was always my Christmas present, like the best the best Predators there were. They were always £100. They always had like the cheaper versions. But my main present was, was the best Predators that they had at the time. And obviously like David Beckham was like a big influence and things like that. So um, yeah, they just supported me in terms of like transport. They, they never forced me into doing anything that I didn't want to do. Um, and obviously bought me kit and things like that. You, you take things like that for granted. But um, you know, I were lucky that, you know, my parents did buy 
time with new kits and things like that. And um, my dad used to take me to Leeds United matches as well when I was younger. Um, he worked for a housing company, Taylor Wimpy, and so he had a lot of kind of like corporate um, invitations to these things. And a lot of people would take like the husbands or the wives. Um, my dad used to always take me, his daughter, um, and I just absolutely loved going to Ellen Road. And I went all over, you know, Sheffield and Barnsley and places like that. But Ellen Road is just a place to be, to be honest. <laughs> um, so yeah, so they they were very much. You know, I guess I guess facilitators. They weren't. Um, cause obviously, you hear the horror stories, don't you, about parents that have a, a child who who looks to be pretty good at a sport, and then that's it. They just they live their lives through them. It's you know, it's it's far too serious. Whatever. But they 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 sound like they were more just right. You like this sport, so yeah, we'll help you. You know, go off and yeah, do what you need absolutely. to do. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Mm-hmm, good. Absolutely. And, what were you like as a as a as a child in terms of a of a player? Because we we I asked a couple of parents for for a few questions for you when they, when they knew you were coming on. And one question we asked, which I thought was a really good one, was, you know, "What were you like as a as a child player?" Um, and then how did you take losing as a child and failure? Yeah, I mean, obviously, like like any child, you hate losing, you hate making mistakes and things like that. Um, and I think, obviously, as I've got all the, you learn to deal with, with certain experiences better. And, you know, when we used to play like the little seven-a-side tournaments and things like that, I'll never forget the day I missed a penalty. And one of my friends, she played for the opposition team in, in the goal. And I missed this penalty. And ever since then, I've been scared to death to take a penalty. Um, because I, I, And they were in the small nets. They weren't even in the big nets at the time. Um, and, ever, and ever since then, I've been scared to take a penalty and um, a couple of years ago for Leeds United it was a, a cup game and they were saying come on Brady you know skipper you, you've got to take the first one and I were like me take a penalty like no the last time I took a penalty it didn't go to plan um, and I just took it and I scored it and I, you know what and I've, I've been fine ever since then but that's just been a fear that I've had for absolutely years but um, I definitely think and you know one of the things I was thinking about is don't let like one mistake um, kind of ruined that game that you're playing at the time or, or, or even affect you as a player um, and I think you know I'll, I'll never forget one of my first games for Leeds United the, the coach said look can you can you play defence and I said I'm, I can give it a go but I'm actually a midfielder um, and the ball was going back towards my own goal and I was shielding it and my keeper was, was coming out to collect it but didn't come out quick enough and the attacker just got in front of me and basically just slotted it slotted it in um, and I remember thinking oh my god like Leeds United they're just going to get rid me straight away my, my first game I've pretty much you know conceded um, conceded a goal um, and you know I could have cried and, and I were in my 20s um, could have cried but you know I, I didn't let that bad moment affect the rest of the game and obviously the rest of my, my playing time at Leeds so I think yeah definitely don't let a mistake you know affect the rest of the game um, and define you as a player and, and then for the for the younger kids because they I think even with parents that we that we speak to that we know are brilliant parents and you know, like like yours, that are just happy for them to be doing something and, and facilitating that. You still get the kids that just beat themselves up because they, you know, they've maybe got high expectations, and so or, or they just can't handle losing. It, did you use, you know, were you a bad loser, or did you use it to drive you on? How, how did you take? How did you take losing as a kid? Yeah, I was a bad loser. I think one thing you've got to remember is, um, you know, you do beat yourself up. And, and even now I, I come home and I think, oh, I should have should have made that tackle. I should have taken an extra touch. I should have done this. I should have done that. Um, but nobody actually remembers that because everybody focuses on their own game. Nobody will remember it apart from yourself. So you do beat yourself up. And, you know, sometimes I'll message the girls and say, oh, I thought I played really bad today. And they'll say, what do you mean? You played, you played great. Um, but you do. You, you naturally just beat yourself up and you just can't do that. Um, and if you do think you've had a bad game, if you've got the facility to kind of analyse your performance, you know, if you can video it or anything like that, then watch it back. Um, you know, we're lucky now that we do have video footage. But, you know, if you've got parents that, that still come and watch it, get them to video some stuff on the phone or or get like a cheap camcorder or something and watch it back because I think that's a really really good way of, of learning um, and stats things like that and, you know if you've got a parent on the sideline get them to take a pen and paper and just mark down how many successful passes you've done or how many headers you've won and things like that um, yeah. and I think that's a really good tool because you can see what you need to work on um, and obviously improve you as a player yeah good good I like that um we were talking before as well about the the, the women's game as a whole um which has gone from strength to strength really in the last few years and and as you say there's more clubs now that are, are, are acknowledging it you've got uh, well man united they, it's their first, their first or second season in the in the 
WSL this year, I think. And so there's, there's more and more clubs coming into it. Um, where do you see it going from here, Bridie, once we get back to normality, obviously? Yeah, I think, obviously, it goes without saying, it's getting uh, bigger and better. Um, obviously, a lot more people are taking note of it. Um, you know, I'll have to be honest, I don't think it will ever be as big as, as the men's sport. I really don't. But I definitely think it, it it's certainly a level now where you can make a career out of it. Um, you know, when I was younger, you know, you couldn't really make a career out of it unless you played for like Arsenal down in London. Um, but even the full-timers at Doncaster Bell still had full-time jobs. And, and this is why, you know, at the time I were always thinking, right, I need something else. I need to go to uni. I need a degree. I need a job. And, you know, I, I never really took football as seriously, I guess, when I was younger. But, you know, now kids growing up have got all these opportunities. And I, I think to myself, I wish I were born a few years later, um, you know, to have the opportunities that, that they've got um so yeah i don't think it will ever be as big as the men but certainly you can make a really good career out of it yeah it's it's funny isn't it i think um it's, it's going to come down to finances really isn't it and i think the the commercial side of things which has uh, as, it, as it always does and we, we talk a lot about it and you just wonder if there was to be you might maybe um maybe a jessica ennis style role model mm. within you know within the, the the england game i suppose um the english game you know some a beckham almost uh, you, you wonder that you wonder if that might impact things slightly because obviously in the states you've got you know you can take your pick can't you and you've been able to take your pick there for the last few years in terms of um you know people that these girls look up to and want to emulate and they've got loads of money pumped into it as a result of, of the commercial opportunities really so yeah it'll be interesting to see but in the world cup last year I think that was a huge, huge step forward. And then you had the um, you had the the Manchester derby, didn't you? I think thirty odd thousand people went to watch mm -hmm. that as well. So you're hoping, yeah. you know, they were just building a bit of momentum before the, the obviously the lockdown stuff. But hopefully, it can hit the ground yeah. running again. I think. I think to be to be fair, if you look, there are you know if you look at the England squad now, there are a few you know quite big role models in there. You know the captain Steph Orton and, and Lucy Bronze, who's the best right back in the world in my opinion. Mm. Um, and you know Lucy plays plays abroad in in France for Lyon, I think she does now. Um, you know so there are like going back to the opportunities that that there are now compared to you know when I was growing up it's absolutely massive um, so I do think that there are role models and you know it's, it's quite nice when you see like the Nike advert and things like that you know quite often you do see some of the women on there now so they are doing more and more stuff um, it's just about we just need a bit more um, mm. you know but like I said if, if we keep going and, and keep keep getting in on the adverts and things like that and I think one of the girls was on the FIFA um, kind of advert or something like that um, so that's amazing we do just need to see a little bit more of it though like you said I think Lucy Bronze to be fair is better than most men's right backs she's unbelievable yeah I think you're right <laughs> she, she, she's, yeah, awesome. she's brilliant um, you look, look like I said to you off air we, we, this is about you know educating parents I suppose giving parents some good info um, and kids as well that are going to listen to this would you what advice would you give to let's say parents first what advice would you give to parents in sport uh, based on, on your experiences I think just you know give them the opportunities to, to make their own decisions don't force them into into doing anything I think um, you know Kids are kids are smart and they'll know when if they want to do something. And I think you know by pushing people. I mean, I know people who, when I were growing up, I thought they're going to be they're going to be the next England star, and they don't play football anymore. Um, you know, when I look at the people I played with at Doncaster Bells, not actually many of us still play football anymore. Um, but I think back to their parents at the time, probably pushing them. You've got to do this. You've got to do this. Um, and I think that's quite sad. And it just they get to the point where not only do they resent the parents, but actually they don't want to play football anymore. Um, and I think, you know, quite often when they do push push uh, the kids, it's it's not the right time. So they could be pushing them to play for a team that actually they're not quite at their level yet and it can really knock the confidence. Um, and, you know, it, it knocked mine, to be fair, but that was nothing to do with, with my parents. When I was coming um, to Doncaster Bell's first team, you know, the players were, were incredible and I was just this young 16-year-old and they were all stronger and fitter and faster. Um, and I felt rubbish. Um, and I thought, I'm not used to this. I'm used to being one of the best in the team and now I've gone from being to, to one of the worst in the team. But that that was just an age thing um, and I, I gave up too easily really and I wanted to, to drop a level so I could be that big fish in the little pond um, and you know part of me thinks actually I do regret that a little bit because had I have just stuck by it um, you know maybe I would have you know been been in their position 
Um, and, it, you know, the, the kids, we've got some young kids coming into our team and, you know, they're sitting on the bench at the moment and they're not getting a lot of game time. But I'm, I'm just saying to them, look, I was you once, you know, I, I was you sitting on a bench and just take it all in, take the experiences in, watch what's going on, look at the people that are in your position uh, on the pitch and see what they're doing and just try and learn from them, really. And I guess the same question then, you might have answered this in a roundabout way, but the same question for advice to kids that, that, that you know, that are maybe looking at people like you and then looking at the superstars on TV and things, thinking, I want to I wanna do that. And you've obviously gone on from grassroots into to playing for Leeds United, captain Leeds United. You've had your ups and downs along the way, as you've just said there. But what, what advice would you give to kids that are wanting to get to as far as they can? In, in any sport, not just football? Yeah, I think, well, going back to what I said for a start is, is practising. Don't wait for your training session um, to, to practise a particular skill as such. So I'd definitely say practice, 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 one of the most important things. Um, and I'd say you've got to remember with football, a lot of it's based on opinions. Um, so, you know, what one coach might rate you, another one might not. Um, you know, so if you do get knockbacks and you spend three or four games on a bench, um, I'll probably say, first of all, be patient, give it some time, wait for your opportunity and then obviously take it. And if it's not working out, you know, try another team um, because in another team you could be the star player. So I'd definitely say, um, obviously, take your opportunities when you can, but, um, you know, don't. You, you will get negative feedback from people. You know, even now, some people might not think um, I'm one of the best players or somebody else on my team shouldn't be in that team. But again, it's based on opinions and ultimately it's what mm. it's what your coach thinks at the time. Um, you know, I'm, I'm quite lucky. I've got a really good relationship with uh, with my coach at Leeds United, um, a guy called Dan O'Hearn. Um, really good guy. So, you know, it, it all just depends, really. Um, and like what I said to you before, don't let one mistake um, define you. Yeah, just keep going back. Um, w- would you do anything differently, right? But you, you, you know, based on what you know now, you've had a good career, played for some great clubs. Would you have done anything differently as a child, or maybe a little bit when you first got into the clubs? Anything you've ever thought about on that on that side of things? Yeah, I think like what I mentioned then about at Doncaster Bells, I had the opportunity there, but because I wasn't one of the best players and the, the coach was quite intimidating at the time as well, but it's probably because I, I didn't really know him and I was, you know, when you, there's, there's quite a big difference between, you know, you're under 16 and then going into to open age. It's, you know, you're not a kid anymore. As far as they're concerned, you're open age football um, and I wasn't used to that. I wasn't used to like that, the, the intenseness in training and uh, being told off and sworn at and things like that, you know. So I was just like, I don't like this. And I, and I ran a mile, basically. Um, and then when I went to America, I, w- I was there for four months. Uh, again, that was really, really intense. I was supposed to be there for four years. Didn't really enjoy it. Um, so I came home. But I am a firm believer that everything happened for a reason. Um, you know, and like I said, you know, had I have stayed in America for four years or stayed at Doncaster Bells or whatever, I might not be the captain of Leeds United now. Um, and it's the club that I support and that I love. So, you know, I am really lucky. I'm really fortunate that I'm in this position. I'm not sure, obviously, how it's how long it's going to last. I am 30 now. Um, <laughs> so I forget that. Um, but no, like I said, everything does happen for a reason. So, I, I, you know, if I did have any regrets, I'd probably say that I do wish I'd have stayed at Doncaster a bit longer. But like I said, everything happens for a reason. Yeah, like you, you also say you've got your your dream, your dream role, really. I mean, captain of Leeds United for you, that's that's got to be got to be the pinnacle. Um, so yeah, I mean, on on that then, your thirty peak, a lot of people would call it now peak peak of your uh, of your career. What have you got any ambitions before that day comes when it's time to hang up the boots? Yeah, I think, well, the aim for Leeds United uh, women at the moment is to get into the Super League. It's, you know, getting getting back to where they belong. And obviously, like what's happened in the past, we've had to almost start from the bottom. And the league that we're in at the moment is a really hard league to get out of. Only one team can get promoted. Uh, to get into the Super League, a lot of it is based on finance, um, what facilities you've got, how much money you've got in the bank, um, all that type of thing. Um, and I think, we, you know, off, off the pitch, we, we're more or less there. It's just on the pitch now. So, you know, we were going to be holding some open trials this year. Um, but obviously it looks like that's not going to happen with everything that's going on with lockdown. So uh, we're not going to get much uh, much notice for the season, I don't think. Uh, that's why I think a lot of the girls are doing things in their own time. Uh, but no, definitely this year it's it's promotion uh, to try and get into the league above. Uh, but then hopefully within the next few years we'll be in the Super League. And if I can get Leeds United anywhere close to that, I'll be really, really happy. Um, but like I said, I mean, you know, there's a lot of uh, young kids coming up now, a lot of really fit um 
professional yeah, you know young kids that, that have got so many more opportunities so uh, no it's really good that the standard of, of, of female football has just has just come up massively um, you know I went to one of the Wildcat sessions a few weeks ago and there's just little kids and I think oh my god you, you know sign her up <laughs> sign her up um, so no they are they are really good and I, I just think the sessions that they're doing now I know quite a few male coaches that, that love coaching uh, women's football as well and, and young girls and stuff and it's so, it's so good to see so many young girls playing it is it is very different. I don't say very different, but it is they like they like sponges and you can tell they, they want to listen and want to learn. Whereas sometimes when you're coaching boys, they're listening but they're doing kick ups or something at the same time and just think you are tearing your hair out of it. <laughs> but yeah, with the girls it's funny and, and they and they try to do everything with perfect technique as well, which which I really like. Um so it, they sometimes start a little bit slow but they get it quicker and nail it a lot quicker. And it looks so good when they when they do it. So yeah, it's um, like I say with our sessions, they're they're mixed, and um, it's just brilliant that there's so many more coming into it. it. It's it really is, and I think in ten years' time, you know, the, like you say, the standards improve so much. In ten years' time, I think it'll be it'll be scary where it could go really, and long may that continue. Um, any any aspirations your side, Bridie, to get into coaching once you do finish playing? Yeah, I've thought about it quite a few times. Um, so I've got my level one coach and I did that a few years ago. Um, I think it, it's difficult when you work full time and you're playing as well. Um, it's difficult to kind of juggle everything. Um, but I do really need to get get my badges done. I'd love to do it while I'm at a team like Leeds United because, you know, that I, I feel like I would have more opportunities there. Obviously, we've got junior section. There's the RTC and the Wildcats and things like that. Um, so I'd definitely like to go into some kind of coaching. Um, but when that will be, I'm not so sure. Like I said, when I broke my leg, um, and I wasn't sure if I were going to play again. Um, you know, one of one of my old coaches and, and good friend Julie Grundy rang me and said, "Listen, get yourself into coaching. Now's the time um, to to do it." Um, but all I, all I could think about, you know, was just getting back on the pitch and just actually playing myself. I didn't I didn't want to be thinking about, you know, what if I can't play football again? That that wasn't an option, um, and that's why I, I obviously took the surgery and, and had that done. So yeah, no, I'd love to get into coaching, especially at Leeds. I, I think. Um, I think that'd just be a dream, to be fair, to be coaching a yeah. girls' team. You'd have a lot to offer as well, and um, but I think you're right in that you, you play, you want to play as long as you can. I think you're a long time retired, aren't you? And it, coaching's brilliant. It's it's it gives you different different goals and different excitements, but play, nothing mm-hmm. nothing does be playing as good as coaching is. It, it, it's yeah, it, it's playing is the when you when you I didn't score much but you know you banged in a few recently you know that feeling or when <laughs> I you didn't want to talk about it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah it, it, yeah I um I wish you luck with that because I think you'd, you'd have a lot to offer and like you say if you can get it done with Leeds and and get into that section by the time you do retire perhaps the it'll be well it should be getting even bigger and better so they'll be crying yeah, out and it's great yeah. to see as well on the on these coaching courses that we've got it's great to see more female coaches getting involved mm-hmm. and, and, and some of them are you know fantastic you listen you listen to their knowledge and things it's brilliant they've come from like I say the RTCs over clubs and things and it's it's it's, it's, it's good it's growing and it's going to get there mm-hmm. definitely it just needs a bit more time and, and a bit more cash I think yeah. and, uh, and it'll be fine um, Bridie yeah. thank you so much for your time really really appreciate it uh, fingers crossed you can get back to doing what you love doing sooner rather than later Um and yeah, well, hopefully, you know, maybe we'll do this again in a, in a few months' time and we'll see how things are looking for you uh, and Leeds at that point. Yeah, no, thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed it. But yeah, if there's anything that I can I can do to help, uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to come by a training session or something like that. Just just let me know. Get your coaching, yeah. Your foot, foot tech, future foot tech yeah. coach. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Brady. You're welcome. Cheers, Luke.